Shabbat Shalom. Welcome to Kehillah Haderet again. As we are celebrating today, not only Shabbat, but the second day of Shavuot, I want to break the ice. My husband usually used to say a joke before his, his Devar Torah. So this is a joke for you, in memory of my beloved Rabbi, my, my hubby. In an effort to better understand his Jewish constituents, the mayor reached out to a popular rabbi. The rabbi invited the mayor to spend Shabbat at his home. The rabbi made Kiddush a blessing Friday night on a full cup of wine. After the fish, they made a lachayim, a toast to life, on some fine scotch. The main course came with Israeli wine. They say the grace after the meal with another cup of wine. The next day, they made kiddush and wine at the synagogue. After the service, they ate crackers with heron and lox and made a few lachayans on schnapps. They went home and the rabbi made another kiddush, another blessing for his family and another cup of wine, some lachayan after the fish, a nice single malt uh, with the holland, the stew that they prepare for the Shabbat afternoon meal, and some more wine for grace after the meal. And then when it got dark, another cup of wine for Havdalah, the end of Shabbat. The mayor said to the rabbi, I had a wonderful time. Thank you for sharing Shabbat with me. I still don't get why you cannot turn the lights off. By now, I do understand why I do understand why you don't drive. I know you're muted, but I, I'm hearing you laughing. Amen. So anyway, so that's all Shabbat about. It's a day of rest and, and cheer and, and just say lachayan and relax. Shabbat is the day that God gave us. So enjoy it let's enjoy and rejoice on shabbat and take it easy this past thursday night we celebrate tikkun late shavuot which literally means rectification for shavuot night <clears throat> many of us they stayed up all night studying listening to different classes from different sources at home with friends with family at shul or many of us will up to the jcc a night where we made sure that we had our table with a beautiful table, white table cover with flowers, with books, with delicious dairy dishes, and of course, a big cup of pot, pot of coffee because it's the night that we have to stay up and study. And even though it can be challenging, because it is, at some point you're yawning and you wanna fall asleep, but the beauty of this holiday is when you see the light coming out. And you feel, I did it, I made it, I stay up. And we had a wonderful prayer, li prayer line that morning and, and we read from the 10 words and it was just a joyful and says, you know, Proverbs 27, 17, just I, as iron sharpens iron, lest one person sharpen another or, or sharpens the character of a friend. So last night, as we entered, we started the second day of Shavuot It was, uh, it was, it, we lit the Shabbat candles. Of course, we lit first the Jared side candle, the memory candles for our beloved ones. And we did another Lachayan, like the joke. And we just were able to rest. We we're able to chill. We we're able to embrace that time. And that's good. And, and Baruch Hashem, God gave us these holidays. And, and just to refresh not only our bodies, but our spirit. And forget about the world, forget about working, about the problems that you have, or put your children to do school, because it's a young talk. It's a day that God gave you. Shabbat is a day that God is giving you. So on that, with that spirit, let's give the spirit a chance. In a day, uncon the uncontrolled ways that, that things are crazy, how do we know that our faith is true? And not just one more religious option among many. The classic answer on Judaism to this question is that our faith is founded not on a private revelation or mystic, of mystical insight, but on an event witnessed 
by the entire community of Israel. And Shavuot, we celebrate this event, the revelation of the Torah, the Torah at, at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 16 to 20 from the TLV says, In the morning of the third day, there was thundering and lightning, a thick cloud of the on the mountain, and the blast of an exceedingly loud shofar. All the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the lowest part of the mountain. Now the entire Mount Sinai was in smoke, because Adonai had descended upon him fire. The smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. The whole mountain quaked greatly. When the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with a thunderous sound. Then Adonai came down onto Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The community of Israel is shaped by the encounter on Sinai and it keeps alive after, after this encounter and for all the generations to follow. Shavuot therefore is an appropriate culmination of our communal prayers. In the same way, the worshippers of Shavuot in Jerusalem, after Messiah's resurrection, witnessed an undeniable communal revelation of the presence of God through the outpouring of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Spirit of God. Acts 2, 1-4 through 4 from the TLV says, The Ruach fills his disi the disciples. When the day of Shavuot had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, that came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Just imagine that rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues like fire spreading out appeared to them and settled on each one of them. They were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in all the tongues as the Ruach enabled them to speak. The Ruah enabled them to speak out. Now, Jewish people were staying in Jerusalem. Devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound came, the crowd gathered. They were bewildered because each was hearing them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, All these who are speaking, Aren't they Galileans? How is that we each hear our, our own birth language? Parsians and Medes, and Elamites, and those living in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya towards Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jewish peoples and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring in our own tongues the mighty deeds of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to each other, What does this mean? Others, talking from saying, they are full of sweet new wine. Peter speaks out to the Shavuot crowd. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Judeans and all who are staying in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. These men are not drunk and you suppose for it is only the third hour of the day. When the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, takes up residence within us, lives in us, lives in your home, my home, he gives us faith to believe to believe God's promises and to depend on him for everything we need. When we use faith like muscles that are exercised, it grows, allowing us to believe and trust God more and more. Keeping in mind that the Ruach HaKodesh, the Spirit of God, is a gentleman. He doesn't manifest where he is not welcome. Let me read that again for you. The Spirit of God is a gentleman. He does not manifest where he is not welcome. I remember one time somebody came to shul, visit us. Uh, my husband was still around. 
And after the service, this person approached my husband and they said, oh, everything was wonderful. The worship, beautiful. You know, everything is beautiful. We like it. Yes, yes. But I don't feel the spirit here. So my husband, as you, many, all of you, many of you met him, my, rival, my husband without hesitation says, next time that you don't feel the spirit, bring it with you. And of course, you know, everybody laugh about it, but it's true. The spirit of God is an intimate relationship. I don't say to you, okay, let me bring the spirit to the shul so you can feel it. No, it's you that have that intimacy with the Holy Spirit. So give the spirit of God a chance in your life. Amen. Ephesians 6, 18 from the TLV says, Pray in the Ruach on every occasion, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, keep alert with perseverance and supplication for all the Kedoshim, the Holy Ones. On Shavuot, both at Mount Sinai and in Jerusalem, God reveals himself to a multitude and forms a community. And both encounters form the basis for a continued community life that sustains the revelation of his spirit. The, the encounter at Mount Sinai includes the gift of the Torah, a document that will become the foundation for the Jewish people for generations to come. After these events and post the resurrection in Shavuot, the book of Acts, pictures a community that has remained a model for the new covenant, the Berich Hadashah, now until this day. Ephesians 3, 16, 18 from the TLV says, I pray that from his glorious riches, he will grant you to be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Ruah, the Holy Spirit, so that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may, may have strength to grasp with all the Kedoshim, the Holy Ones, what is the width, the length, the height, and the depth. The community in the book of Acts embodies the message that the powers of the age to come had already arrived in the person of the Messiah. His very life was available to all through the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And now they could share that abundant supply with each other, overcoming the traditional hesitation. The first century community itself provided the strongest evidence for the claims of Messiah and may be so today as well. And just to clarify, the first community of believers, those that were walking with Yeshua, were Jewish. Not because they believed that Yeshua is the Messiah back then and then they stopped being Jewish. They kept, they kept all the traditions. They kept observing Shabbat. So if anybody tells you different because they believe in Yeshua, that Yeshua is the Messiah, now all that community are Christians. That's a name, but that's for another, we can discuss about that later. But yes. Yeshua of Nazareth was the Messiah, is the Messiah, will continue being the Messiah, and the believers continue to be Jewish. The post Shavuot community in Acts continued to meet the, in the temple courts and to dwell within the house of Israel. We cannot build genuine community isolated from the larger Jewish community. We are Messianics. Our friends, the Jewish people, the ones who do not believe in Messiah, our friends, the Christians, that do not believe in, in Torah. They don't believe in the law of Moses. We are in the middle. And we need to keep relation with both. We're, I, sometimes I feel like we are the bridge. And that's beautiful. Give the Spirit of God a chance in your life. As a result, we overcome communal isolation, but we need to overcome individual isolation yes this is true our our individualist age is ca characterized by busyness whether with work or entertainment many times don't you find yourself busy with many things in life that's what shabbat is for 
for you to pull yourself from all those distractions and not to be rushing about the busyness of life, about the problems, the situations, the circumstances. No, pull yourself from it. It's your Shabbat, your day to refresh, to strengthen your body, your mind, to just be chill. When we do not observe Shabbat or any other Jewish holiday and we keep a regular daily routine, Many times because our life is evolving about things of the world and distracted by our, our own problems. We can get distracted and, and trust me, I know what distraction is. You know what distraction is. We ended up disconnecting completely, not only from our community, but also from him and his spirit. Listen to that again. We are disconnecting from community and his spirit. Give the spirit a chance. I have heard yes so many times. Oh, sometimes people have to go through this so they can live and learn. True, very true. Nevertheless, if you are part of a community, we can speak that conf with a conflicted person at that moment because we are all going through issues at one time or another. Hey, we're not perfect. But in love, let's reach out to our brother, sister, Whoever, hello, you are disconnecting, connecting truth. Come back. What's happening? At least you did your part. Whatever may be the outcome, but at least you did it. We need to watch for one another, care for one another. We become preoccupied and occupied with distractions with so many things in life, with, with things from the world. In contrast, the post Shavuot community had time for each other, had time to rejoice in Him, had time to, to, to just dwell in that Spirit of God, which is beautiful. The gift of the Spirit is not some sort of a spiritual accessory, but a transforming power in our lives. Each one of us have an intimate relationship with the Spirit. Isaiah 11.2 from the TLB says, The Ruach of Adonai will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and insight, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Adonai. The fear of Adonai is the beginning of wisdom. We cannot welcome Messiah home apart from a preparatory and empowered visit of the Ruach, a visit also promised in the scripture. Zechariah 12 10 from the TLB says, mourning the pierced one, then I will put out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. When they look toward me whom they pierce, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and grieve bitterly for him as one grief <clears throat> for the firstborn. We can now welcome the Messiah home as a people without the pour out spirit of grace and supplication. As we celebrate Shavuot this year, and today is the second and last day of Shavuot, may your expectancy of the Ruah remain. Give the Spirit a chance. The Holy Spirit brings to us a supernatural life, including in our workplace dealings. He brings truth to life, so as to guard against deception and provides heavenly wisdom to discern right from wrong. He empowers and consoles us so we may not become discouraged. He blesses us with that shalom that surpasses all understanding. Unfortunately, not everyone who accepts the Holy Spirit accepts Him without reservations and conditions. Many believers are not willing to stop living as the world lives. And this includes the workplace, our home, our thoughts, our actions. We receive the Holy Spirit, but are unwilling to allow Him to control our lives. When the Holy Spirit checks us, too often we ignore Him. Have you ever heard that voice 
sometimes telling you, oh, this is the right thing to do, but you go against that. Okay. For what he's bringing to our attention, that need changing. Changing interferes with our lifestyles. When we want something, we deliberately do not pray about it because we don't want to be told no. True story. Very personal story. A lot of you lived that with me, with, with our family. Even though my heart was shattered into thousand pieces, and some days are easier than other, I remember clearly and palpable the presence of His Spirit and that special connection with God while my husband was residing in the hospital, Mount Sinai, you know, so bizarre, Mount Sinai Hospital, for seven months and seven days. I remember I received a phone call on Shabbat on January 29th. The doctor said to me, your husband collapsed. And everything collapsed in him. We've been working for him um, on him for five hours already. Now he's stable. We cannot move him. We cannot touch him. We need to keep an eye on him. Calm immediately. So I remember after the Shabbat service, I got dressed. I checked if my mother-in-law was here so I can drop my son and I run. I, I think I, anyway, don't exactly remember more details in that, but I do remember that they allowed me to enter to the room. They put me all kind of, you know, covering so I don't get infected and they allowed me only to be by his feet. I did ask the doctor, can I touch his feet? I'm with gloves. He says, sure. So I touch him. I pray for him. Little did I know that the doctors thought that he wouldn't make it that night. They thought that they would lose him any moment. And now I realize that. I pray so hard and I say, Father in heaven, I ask to please allow him to reach his birthday which was March 24th, and he did. I know that his spirit, the spirit of God was with me, was with him, was with us, was in the hospital, was in this house, because I was able to feel that spirit sustaining me. He gave us the opportunity, and even though that at the end of the day, my husband is now resting with his ancestor, God gave us that opportunity to have closure. A lot of you know the details. And honestly, I don't know how I was able during all this season, these seven months and seven days, to text, to email, to keep working at my job, full-time work, different hours, of course, taking care of our son who was and is homeschooling, doing the school and doing prayer lines. Of course, I have my beautiful sisters helping me with the prayer lines, keeping running the Shabbat, every Shabbat via Zoom and Baruch Hashem to all the people that volunteer for the Devar Torahs. That was a blessing, but that was a blessing from the Spirit. Everybody came together as a community, friends, everybody. That Spirit was so felt. And now that I'm writing this and I'm saying it out loud and I was, when I was typing this message, I didn't, I realized I didn't do any of this. What's the spirit that led me? A spirit that took control of my life, took control of the situation. Because me, myself and I could never, have never done this. It's him. I allow the spirit to come and dwell and direct my life. I remember asking God, please do not take him on my birthday, July 31st. Go, June, uh, January 29th, March 24th, July 31st. And he didn't. He didn't. He, it was a terrible day. For some of you that know, it was a, it was a bad day, but he didn't take him that day. Then our anniversary came, August 16, 20 years of marriage. 
And suddenly that day, that morning, I woke up and I knew. But I refused to accept it. I refused to accept it and I'm human and I'm, and I refused. And I kept praying. We kept praying. We kept begging. We kept supplicating. We kept asking. I believe, I believe because I believe in miracles. But I knew somehow I knew. That was the spirit too. And yes, I cried. Somehow I had that shalom. That shalom that surpasses all understanding and only is given to you by the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 through 14 from the TLV says, But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own, but whatever He hears, He will tell you and will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because He will take from, that, from what is mine and declared it to you. I came back home from the hospital. And after sending more texts and emails. And making all the arrangements. Because yes, I had to do all the arrangements. Calling, contacting a bank. Uh, anyway, the, the amount of work that got involved after that. Again, his spirit led me each and every step of the way this flesh and blood couldn't have done that and for that we must develop the mind of Yeshua and live as he instructed that is not possible if we refuse to accept the Holy Spirit's checks and guidance give the spirit a chance in your life we are go all going through troubles some bigger some tinier you know Problems at work, financial problems with your spouse, with our children, battling with habits and behaviors, and even with our own health. Then the words of my mother come to mind. My mother always says to us, to, for everything there is a solution except for death. So it doesn't matter what problem you have in life, regardless, there is always a solution. You may don't like the outcome, but that is always a solution. In all things you do, apply His Spirit into it to lead the way always, knowing, believing, and relying on Him, His Spirit at all the time. Keep in mind that not everyone claiming to be a believer has the advantage. Many believers desire to live as the world does and reject the work of the Holy Spirit. In every facet of their life, of their life, as a result, they deny the advantage they could have. Living a Holy Spirit-led life doesn't mean that we cannot enjoy nice things, or have nice homes, or drive good nice cars, or treat beautiful to all our family and friends. It doesn't mean allowing the Holy Spirit. It does mean allowing the Holy Spirit free reign to check our decisions and we are to pray continually for guidance our self-centered natures and pride will always fight for control of our lives and so many times like immature people sometimes we want we want we want and this is what we want we want back off back up a step back analyze your life do a check and balance this is what i'm supposed to be doing this is what the spirit is leading me to do because if the spirit is leading you to do something hey go for it but many times we let our being our desires are just sitting around do things that perhaps you're not supposed to do. Think things that you're not supposed to be thinking. Act in a way that you shouldn't be acting. Let the Spirit lead your life. So when everything that you do, you don't compromise. You don't walk around trying to do things that you're not supposed to be doing. But being led by the Spirit. How much control 
are willing to give the Holy Spirit. My suggestion here, embrace, this, embrace the presence of the Holy Spirit in every other thing will be taken care of it in your life. Let me repeat that again. Embrace the presence of the Holy Spirit and every other thing will be taken care of in your life. Give the Holy Spirit a chance. Shabbat Shalom and Hashabot Sameach. Amen.